Hi, and welcome to Quarantine Cocktails with Chad and Nicole. This week, we're talking about the mojito. This classic cocktail is said to have originated in Havana, Cuba. Although, like many cocktails that we talk about, the precise origin is unknown. Um, what we do know is that the mojito is a refreshing summertime drink, uh, mixing white and silver rum usually with sugar, lime, mint, and soda water. Um, generally served in a highball glass with crushed ice. In some ways, it has a lot of similarities to the daiquiri, which we've talked about, except the um, differences um, with this being the inclusion of mint and the soda water. Yeah, and some of the preparation technique as well, which mm -hmm. we will get into. Now, um, rum is a liquor made from fermenting and then distilling uh, sugarcane juice. Uh, or sugarcane molasses, usually the molasses, uh, although sometimes the sugarcane juice is the base. Um, there are recorded references to rum or rum-like liquors dating back to 7th century Sanskrit texts. Um, and uh, in Malaysia, there is a drink called broom, uh, which uh, may go back thousands of years. Um, so more recently, um, Peter of Cyprus is reported to have taken rum to the Congress of Krakow, um, which was a meeting of the European monarchs uh, of Central Europe in 1364, uh, when they were uh, discussing how to deal with Turkish aggression and form other diplomatic ties and pacts. Um, so modern rum uh, is traced back to the Caribbean where it was produced starting um, in about the 1600s. So sugarcane plantations um, played a huge role in uh, the triangular trade patterns of the European maritime colonial era. Yes. Northern European traders uh, traveled south to Africa with manufactured goods on board like guns, um, textiles, distilled spirits being uh, many of those. They traded them uh, largely for slaves, um, which were then taken uh, to the Caribbean and sold to work plantations, sugarcane being one of the main crops there. Yeah, so this is so part this has of the- sort of a sorted past. Yes, the colonial era and many yeah. of its uh, activities were a little less than, uh, less than good from a modern perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, so the sugar cane was refined and otherwise prepared uh, in there and then transported back across the Atlantic to Europe. Um, and the pattern of that route was dictated a lot by the prevailing wind patterns that um, sort of make it a lot easier to travel from east to west once you get down uh, below 30 degrees latitude and those were known as the trade winds. So we talked about sugarcane. Uh, so molasses was actually originally um, a waste byproduct of the sugar production. So plantation uh, slaves took the molasses and produced rum from it, from what we've read. And soon this caught on and became part of the exported product from the Caribbean um, to Europe, especially since rum was actually cheaper to transport than the sugar harvest was. So speaking of transporting, um one of the things that uh, was also going on was a British uh, naval presence uh, in the Caribbean, kind of defending the trade interests of Britain um, as they were in, uh, involved in this triangular uh, trade process. And uh, the Navy rationed their sailors uh, to be drinking a gallon of beer a day. Uh, now, a lot of it was sort of near beer that was you know, less than 1% alcohol, but still, that's a lot of liquid to be transporting around. Mm -hmm. uh, and so over time, uh, rum and brandy became popular uh, as a replacement because it was sort of, you know, more alcohol, I think, packed into a smaller amount and they were rationed a certain amount of spirits. Now, um, the spirit ration uh, in 1655, for example, uh, was set to be half a pint or basically a cup uh, of of rum uh, or brandy, um, which was known as the daily tot. So you can imagine with everybody being rationed these, you know, 
strong alcohols every day, uh, drunkenness became a big problem. And through, um, and in 1740, it was regulated to be diluted four to one with water and split into two servings. So in 1824, it was cut in half. In 1850, halved again. So the tradition continued of the um, daily rations up until July 31st of 1970 when that rationing um, practice ended. So the day is actually known as Black Tot Day. Um, and I guess we just passed the 50th anniversary of the Black Tot Day. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I guess, are we celebrating or commiserating? I don't know. I don't know. But, um, so that was the practice of giving out uh, uh, rum rations. Now, uh, secret dilution of the rum on board as people were trying, would take some and then refill uh, with water was an issue. And so this uh, led to a practice known as proving the rum. Uh, where the rum was actually mixed with gunpowder to form a kind of paste, uh, and then it was lit. Uh, and uh, if it produced flame, so if the alcohol content was high enough that it overcame the fact that it was also wet with water, um, then the uh, the you know the material would the paste would combust, uh, and this was known as uh, uh, proving it, or or that the alcohol was proof strength. Uh, which was roughly 57% ABV, uh, and it later got regulated to be that, that value. Um, Navy strength, by the way, uh, was set to be somewhere just below proof strength eventually, and was set at about 54%. Um, although you will sometimes see rum uh, and gin uh, today labeled as Navy strength, um, but gen and generally that's labeled actually at proof strength at 57%. So going back to the Caribbean for a moment, uh, the Caribbean also became the focal point of piracy in the 18th, or sorry, 16th through the 18th centuries um, due to the profitability of the triangular trade routes. Uh, the pirates would raid naval and uh, merchant vessels um, and take hostages, seize goods, um, including the increasingly popular rum. Mm -hmm. So soon it became the pirates' favorite drink where they mixed with water, they added citrus, fruit to make uh, what's known as grog, um, and then that also combated scurvy. Arr. <laughs> A common affliction back then. <laughs> <laughs> um, this was also the age of the privateers, um, who were basically legally sanctioned pirates. Um, so they were commissioned by various European powers to carry out raids on their colonial uh, rivals and seize you know, treasure or goods from, from them. Um. So, uh, Sir Francis Drake is probably the most famous privateer and one of the most notable sailors and naval commanders of the late 16th century. Um, Drake's exploits made him a hero to the English, but his privateering led the Spanish to brand him a pirate, and they gave him the name El Drac. Or El Drake? El Drake, I think, yes. The, the dragon, I think, or, oh, maybe it's the Drake, like, the, anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, he sailed to the West Indies on two occasions, uh, once in 1585, which was a huge success from the British standpoint, um, and uh, then again in 1896, uh, which was a terrible failure and, in fact, resulted in Sir Francis Drake's death in Panama. Mm -hmm. So we mentioned Sir Francis Drake because there is one popular story uh, that he's actually the inventor of the mojito. So uh, ah, back to the mojito. Yeah. <laughs> his failed final voyage saw him uh, outside Havana, Cuba, where his men suffered from dysentery, scurvy, uh, and he used some local remedies as a kind of medicinal grog, um, including spirits, lime, sugar, and what's known as yerba buena which is the regional name for mint. So the cocktail by the name of El Drac became popular in Havana shortly after this. And, um, you know, it's unlikely that rum was, uh, that it was a rum-based drink at that time, but, you know, an interesting story that yes. may uh, or may not be true. Yes, another story uh, <laughs> credits African plantation slaves in Cuba with the invention of the mojito. Um, and that seems a little bit more likely from my perspective. Uh, 
And uh, the claim there is that the, the word mojito is actually derivative from the word mojo, uh, which was uh, a sort of, a, you know, African spiritual beliefs in spells, uh, the word for spells. Uh, so and you know, maybe the drink would cast a spell on you. So finally, uh, there's a Havana bar called La Bodeguita del Medio. Medio. Pardon my Spanish there, <laughs> Melly. <laughs> uh, whose owners claim that their bartenders were the first to make the mojito. Uh, in addition, Hemingway was also said to frequent this bar, presumably when he wasn't downing um, Papa Dobles at Fl La Floridita, as we discussed in our daiquiri episode. So. Whichever of these stories is true, uh, the mojito is certainly a truly delicious and refreshing drink, mm -hmm. uh, in part due to the presence of yerba buena, the good herb, Ooh. aka mint. So mints uh, that we encounter are typically classified as either spearmint or peppermint, but there is actually a huge amount of mint varieties, as you can imagine. Yeah, there are three primary um, natural mints that uh, are used uh, for culinary and medicinal purposes. Uh, one is called menta spicata, which is Spanish mint, uh, and that's basically the base variety of spearmint. There's uh, menta aquatica, or water mint, um, which is used to make bergamot, uh, and mm -hmm. You find that in herbal remedies and also uh, is what gives uh, Earl Grey tea its uh, characteristic flavor. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's Menta Suave Lens, uh, which is also known as apple mint or woolly mint. Um, and it is sweet like spearmint, but also has some nice citrus flavor to it. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. So peppermint is actually a hybrid of spearmint and watermint and is pretty high in menthol. So it's known as Mentha, do we say the X in the so, name? Yeah. Mentha X uh, piperata, piperata, mm -hmm. and the X denotes that the mint is actually a hybrid uh, version. And uh, Mentha spicata uh, has numerous varietals, um, as does Mentha piperata. Uh, one well known Mentha spicata varietal is Kentucky Kernel, mm -hmm. um, which is prized for its use in mint juleps. Wow. So as for the piperata, there are uh, varieties such as orange mint and chocolate mint, interestingly enough. Yeah, and those will have that strong sort of menthol flavor to them. Who knew? There was so much information about mint. Mm -hmm. And next time you go to the grocery store and you see mint, check to see which kind it is. It might be an interesting little... <laughs> they might not even tell you. But... That's true. That's true. <laughs> but they might. Uh, Cuban mint, uh, the kind likely used in the original mojito, um, is Mentha Villarosa, um, also known as Mentha Nemorosa, which is a hybrid of spearmint and apple mint. So it's low in menthol, but it does have that sweet citrusy flavor to it. Yeah. So you might not be able to find them all at your uh, local grocery store or know which ones they have. But uh, if you do go to a nursery, uh, you can, plant nursery, you can actually go in and pick up some varietals and they'll be labeled with the kind and you can um, grow those at home and try them out if you feel like uh, feel so inclined. Mm -hmm. um, do be aware that mint is a rather invasive plant, so keep it well contained. Uh, and also, if you have multiple varietals, you want to actually keep them spaced apart because they tend to cross pollinate quite uh, easily. Uh, if you want to keep the distinct flavors and keep them separate. So we have a park across the street from our house, and I went over there, and there's wild mint growing, wild rosemary, and I picked some of the mint and there were two or three different kinds and I brought it inside and I washed it and I tasted them and they taste pretty different. So I don't know what kinds they are, but you know, some interesting information. Absolutely. Could, yeah. Um, and you can, I mean, they definitely have distinct flavors yeah. depending on uh, what, what they are. All right. So history lessons done. Well, actually I wanted to talk a little oh, bit okay. about Bacardi. Oh, okay. um, so, uh, Bacardi is probably, so given that this is a Cuban rum drink, and Bacardi is probably the most famous uh, of Cuban rum producers, it, it was started in uh, Cuba in 1862 by a Mr. Bacardi, who was a Spanish immigrant um, to Cuba, and uh, he was trying to make a white, so 
it, it's actually interesting, white or silver rum originally is, is less aged than the darker rums, and because of that, it's actually harsher and more spirit forward in its flavor and less, uh, you know, as they age, it tends to mellow and, and, um, and gets a little sweeter um, and, and more flavorful, honestly. So um, Bacardi set out to make a better tasting silver rum. Uh, and he did that through a process of charcoal filtration and a little bit of aging and was able to take the local sort of white rum and make it a little bit more palatable uh, as, as it is. And so that was kind of partly why Bacardi was so successful. Um, so your, you know, uh, Bacardi company, of course, um, uh, kind of moved out of Cuba um, during the Castro revolution. Um, and uh, so they no longer operate out of Cuba. In fact, there's sort of quite a lot of animosity. Um, so today we're using the uh, Bacardi's Havana Club, um, which is made in the, I guess, the Cuban style, mm -hmm. um, although it is made in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. um, and there's actually some controversy because the Cuban government also owns a distillery that produces a, a Havana Club branded uh, oh. uh, uh, rum, and so there's quite a lot of, of discord between them. Um, the Havana Club that you'll get in Europe will generally actually be the Cuban one um, because it's also distributed by the uh, Ric uh, Ricard, uh, Pernod Ricard uh, group uh, in association with the Cuban government. But in the US, this is the Havana Club you get, which is produced by Bacardi in Puerto Rico in the Cuban style. So this is the rum that we're going to be primarily uh, featuring, but I decided to also include a little bit of this plantation three star uh, to bring in some other flavor from other parts of the Caribbean. This is a blend of rums from Jamaica, Barbados, and Trinidad. And so those three marry nicely. And so we'll get a little flavor of, of the whole of the, um, of the whole of the Caribbean as we make this drink. Um, we've got, sure. So I've got, I'm calling this in honor of the Mojo version. I'm calling this the Got My Mojito working because that was the origin story that I thought had the most, uh, seemed the most relevant. Um, so we're going to be using those two rums. We've got the one to one simple syrup. We're going to be using fresh squeezed lime as always. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, we've got mint. And we're actually just going to use some mint from some mint plants that I picked up at the nursery. Um, this one is the apple mint. Uh, also known as the woolly mint, and I'm not sure if you can quite tell, but it's a little hair. It's got a little hairiness to it, and it's got some redness in the leaves. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure if that's just a feature not. of this particular plant's health, mm. <laughs> but, uh, but much larger leaves. Yes, and then this is the Kentucky Colonel, um, which has uh, just a little darker green than some of the other uh, Menta Spicata varietals, and it's really got a lovely sweet flavor. Um, so you know. We're going to use a blend of these two uh, in honor of the herb, uh, the hybrid version, the Yerba Buena uh, hybrid, which is a hybrid of those two varietals, or uh, you know, or version of those two. Um, and as always, with we're so we're going to do the preparation a little different than how a standard uh, mojito is done as well. Um, and you know, a, a lot of people will simply just. Put, put in the mint, muddle it with maybe some of the simple syrup or the lime and the simple syrup, add the rum, put in the crushed ice, do a little shake and then top with the soda. You know, that tends to lead to the soda sitting on top. Uh, and so we're actually gonna put the soda in first. Um, we're going to shake the other ingredients without the mint. So we're gonna muddle the mint with the soda. We're going to shake the other ingredients separately to get later. them well mixed. And then we'll pour it in and then the soda will actually rise through the drink uh, and should get a better mix of things. So um, it's a little bit more elaborate than you would do in a bar if you were a bartender, but since you're doing it at home and you're not making them in high volume, I think you can go to for making it a, a, a little bit more, uh, uh, I think a better drinking experience. Sure. So uh, as always, we've got our glasses. Chilling. I'm squeezing the lime over here. As almost always, we're chilling and we're going to use these 
as our high balls. I'm going to select a few choice leaves. That was probably way more information than you needed to know about mint, but now you know. <laughs> now you're an expert. Correct. So I'm going to select a bunch of choice leaves off of my mint plants here. Mm -hmm. The apple mint leaves are pretty large, so I'm really only going to need one of those in each drink. Okay. So we will drop our mint in. Try not to get the stem. If you pick the stem, the stem is pretty bitter, um, and so that will ruin the flavor. So try to keep the stems out. That's also why I don't recommend using a sprig of uh, mint to garnish. Now in terms of muddling, some people do a, a lot of muddling, some people do a little bit of muddling, uh, or even just letting the ice do the muddling. I found that a little bit of muddling, but using actually the blunt side of the muddler, rather than the um, sort of pointy, pointed side of the muddler, does a little bit better job of keeping the mint healthy but releasing enough of the oils. So we'll put that in. I'm just gonna use this Canada Dry, a very Caribbean-oriented uh, soda water. If you're measuring know. a mm -hmm. spoon over there, and how much are you putting in? I'm gonna put three ounces of this in here for this size. Two to four ounces is good. I kind of bumped up the proportion of all the ingredients, so I think three ounces is good. Okay, and then we just let that sit in the just, chilled glass. Just while let we those sit shake. while we work on the other ingredients. Okay. Yep. So. Ice. I'm now going to put this in my shaker. So I am going to shake this. A lot of people won't shake their mojito. Their mojito. Um, but you know, usually that's because they're concerned about bruising the mint. So because I'm not including the mint uh, in the shaker, I'm, I feel pretty good about this choice. Um, and I'm going to shake not to get dilution because this drink, because I'm putting crushed ice in too, this drink is pretty diluted by the crushed ice pretty quickly. And so, um, I'm, I'm shaking primarily just to get cooling and to get good mixing of the ingredients. So I'm going to put in an ounce and a half of my simple syrup mm -hmm. and then an ounce and a half of the fresh lime. Fresh lime. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for freshening the lime, making the lime fresh. I'm going to do the same. Oh yes. And while we're at it, since we're shaking and we're using citrus, we will include a few drops of our saline. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, which, as we know, reduces the bitterness and brings forward the sweetness and the tartness of the drink overall. Mm -hmm. So, we're going to briefly shake this, not as long. I'm using the freezer ice, so it's going to get nice and cold pretty quickly. I'm really not trying to get a ton of dilution, right? Luckily, we know it doesn't dilute very quickly when we do it this way. So the last thing we're going to do is get out our crushed ice. So I made some crushed ice using our food processor. So we'll put the crushed ice in while we're working on that. It froze together a little bit, so we're breaking it up a bit. How much do you need? A handful in each one. Okay. Enough to make That's it... good enough. Mm, I think a little more. Okay. We'll get in there. We'll get crushed ice flying everywhere, Crush but that's it. all right. Crush it. Arrgh. Enough crushed ice for a good fill of the drink with the soda. And then we will strain. 
the goods on top. And then we will garnish with our lime wheels. We'll leave off the mint garnish for now. And we will give it a quick stir with our straw. And there we will have our delicious mojito. refreshing mojito. <laughs> That's too much alcohol. Cheers. That is a perfect <laughs> for a 12-year-old. Yes. Perfect amount of alcohol. <laughs> I ruined it. <laughs>